Welcome to Education Matters. I'm your host, Marianne Wolf. Today we are coming to you from the second half of the seventh annual Eggs and Issues Breakfast presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. Today's discussion on equity and education policy will be hosted by Lauren Fox, the Senior Director of Policy at the Forum. Today we have Dr. Anthony Graham, who is provost at Winston-Salem State University and also the chair of the Governor's Drive Task Force with us. We have Representative Ricky Hurtado, who is one of our newest members of the North Carolina General Assembly, rep representing Alamance County. We have Maggie Murphy, who is a Regional Teacher of the Year from Allegheny County Schools and Reagan Raison, who is a senior at Enlo High School in Wake County. So I'm so grateful to be with all of you today. Thank you so much for joining us. So I wanna start with a question for all of you. Um, you know, as we've talked about this year has exacerbated already existing inequities in our education system in the community and the state overall. So as we look ahead to the year um, before us, please share briefly about yourself and your perspective and what you think the key issues that the state and district leaders as well as others in the field of education will need to consider this year to address these inequities. I think entering this year, entering the session and just entering as a, another human trying to survive the multiple crises we're facing as a state and as a nation, there's a few things that, that are on top of mind. And I think it's, for me, it's to make clear that we have to operate with an urgency of now. And, and what I mean by that is that recognize that we are at a crossroads of, of multiple crises uh, a public health crisis that we're still navigating in this global health pandemic, a racial justice crisis that has really elevated the conscience of a nation, as well as a constitutional crisis in North Carolina, where we have learned that we have not been meeting our constitu constitutional duty as a state to meet the sound uh, basic educational needs of every child in, in North Carolina. And so I think it's important to understand that all three of these are interconnected, and, and, and they are not a coincidence that those that continue to see the worst educational health or economic outcomes all tend to be in the same groups where they're talking about historically marginalized groups or low income and working families. Uh, I think this is a call to action for all of us to, to make sure that we are taking every step we can in 2021 to work towards recovery and progress. Ms. Raison, let's go to the student perspective. It's important to me that state um, leaders and district leaders put an emphasis on listening to the youth when addressing inequities in our school system. Um, as I've met with different um, leaders from Wake County, Durham County, and across the states, um, I've never been disappointed with what has been brought to the table. So I think that by providing students this platform, whether it be in individual schools or district-wide, um, and letting them engage in these conversations about decision making, um, ultimately our school systems will strengthen and the bonds between administrators and students will strengthen. Ms. Murphy. All of these points that are being made are exactly where we need to head and I think that if you put all of these people together in a room, we could just solve it all. We could just get it done, right? So I think these raising voices like Reagan's and having educators like my friend Daniel, I think um, I think talking about these issues is important, but I'm ready to jump in and solve them and start getting to work on each of these and how we can move forward in North Carolina together with this common uh, vision that we have. Dr. Graham. In a very global way, I think the issue that resonates most with me is while we've been busy at work, where we've been toiling away on a daily basis, our schools have resegregated racially and economically right underneath our noses. Since 1996 to now, the number of segregated schools in the United States has doubled. What we're seeing is what we call in educational research, double segregation, where low income students and students of color are consistently concentrated in a subset of schools. And then those schools are systematically and significantly under-resourced and underfunded. So we segregate them racially, and then we hit them with a double whammy by segregating them economically. Then we add injury to insult by using a grading system where we affix a scarlet letter to an underfunded, under-resourced school and publicly shame them for their underperformance when in fact we haven't been bold or courageous enough to give them the financial support that they need. So uh, in that double segregated environment, we also know that there are gaps in access and gaps in opportunity. We know in some of these schools that uh, rigorous curriculum isn't an option advanced 
placement isn't present. International baccalaureate isn't an option. Uh, courses like chemistry, physics, algebra two may not be an option. So how are these students then becoming college ready? The sad reality of this situation is our school should be a place where we're teaching our students about equity and how to share power and resources to create a society that's just and equitable. Instead, we're teaching our students in the very design of our public schools about segregation, about inequities, and about oppression, and how to create and maintain a system that disenfranchises people through policy and budgetary appropriations. This is, and will always be from my vantage point, the greatest educational equity issue that we must address in the state of North Carolina and in the United States of America. Thank you for bringing up the issue of segregation. I think this is something that um, many of us fear will become even worse after COVID and that North Carolina has been a leader um, in school desegregation in the past and we've really gone backwards. So let's move on to another topic that all of you, I believe, are passionate about, teacher diversity. We know that teacher diversity is very important for all of our students and especially for our students of color, but our teacher workforce is not representative of our student population in North Carolina. So what steps do you think that our states and districts should take to improve recruitment and retention of teachers of color? And I will start with our DRIVE Task Force Chair, Dr. Graham. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, as many of you know, I am the chair of the DRIVE Task Force. If you're unfamiliar with the DRIVE Task Force, DRIVE is an acronym that stands for Developing a Representative and Inclusive Vision for Education. Governor Cooper uh, commissioned this group back in December of 2019 to really study and investigate the issue of how do we go about diversifying the teacher workforce in the state of North Carolina. From a recruitment standpoint, we really need our good friends at the General Assembly, Assembly to invest dollars and resources in providing scholarships, loan forgiveness initiatives, and tuition reimbursement opportunities that would help alleviate financial barriers for all teachers, yes, but particularly for students and candidates of color. We know based on loan default rates that so many of our uh, alumni or our students of color who have graduated from our universities tend to default at a higher rate. So if we can put in place initiatives that will allow our students of color to pursue a degree or certification in the teaching profession and do so without having financial burden and barrier be a mitigating factor, then that would be uh, an ideal uh, scenario. Secondly, we talk a great deal about the Teaching Fellows Program, and a lot of people put a lot of faith in the Teaching Fellows Program. I like the Teaching Fellows Program, but we have to also accept the reality that the Teaching Fellows Program has historically perpetuated the number of white teachers whom we produce for our K-12 classrooms. So we have to think differently about the Teaching Fellows Program. We don't have the Teaching Fellows Program in its current configuration housed at any of our historically black colleges and universities. That's problematic. We also have to think about the individuals who graduate from our teaching fellows program. In many ways, these are our best and brightest new teachers, but we don't ask them to serve our state by teaching in low income schools, in rural schools, or in urban schools. So we allow the best and brightest of our new teachers to go to the best and brightest of our schools and our state is not benefiting in terms of our students who are in underfunded, uh, under-resourced schools. So we have to make sure that we stop advantaging the advantage and disadvantaging the disadvantage and then blaming the disadvantage for the disadvantages. Uh, finally, from a retention standpoint, I would say we need to make sure that we're funding and supporting career development initiatives for our teachers of color, such as the National Board Certification Process. Uh, very proud of the state of North Carolina. We have a large number of National Board Certified teachers here, but when you look at the demography of who's nationally board certified, 93% of our National Board Certified teachers in this uh, state of North Carolina are white. What can we do to diversify the National Board Certified pool within the state? Because we know with that comes pay increase to your base salary. So these are some of the things that we need to think about from a recruitment and retention standpoint, particularly for our teachers of color. Ricky, you're also a member of the task force. Would you like to share any additional thoughts? I think that we're gonna be continuing to have conversations around why representation matters, that it's not just a moral imperative, but an economic imperative to make sure that our students see themselves in our teachers, administrators, and leadership in our community. 
just from a personal standpoint, I've been doing a lot of this work for the last few years and, and, and I teach at the School of Education at UNC. And so I've had, I've had students on the first day of class come up to me with tears in their eyes because I'm the first Latino teacher that they've ever had to say I've never had someone who understood me, who looked like me, who understood my experiences in history. Uh, and it just cre completely changed the dynamic in, in the classroom. I would also add that teacher diversity is not just uh, of critical importance for our students of color. It's also, it's important for all students, right? Having a diverse classroom matters for everyone. And so we all learn from having a diverse classroom, not just in the student population, but in this, in the people that are, are serving our students. And so I'm excited to continue uh, to be in a position to push these conversations forward because I think this is certainly a time to do it. When we come back, we'll have more discussion with our panelists. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back. Our State Board of Education and the Department of Public Instruction have been working on revising the state social studies standards. And there's a lot of discussion about ensuring that our curriculum is culturally responsive and inclusive and that it represents an accurate um, perspective on our history. So I'd like for you all to speak on why this is important for our students and what you all think the state district and educators um, should move to, should do to move towards a more culturally responsive and inclusive curriculum. Well, I think one um, aspect that could be changed, and this is even on the small level, is just changing our language when it comes to teaching history, um, rather than referring to it as slaves, uh, refer to people who were enslaved, or talking about the homeless as people who are experiencing homeless. It's this little shift in language that um, can, it's, it can seem small and trivial, but it does make a difference in the long run. And then also while we're talking about changing um, curriculum to be more culturally responsive. Um, I don't want it to be just limited to social studies and history. Um, it's important to make sure that this um, finds its way in the um, env environmental science classes, in the math classes, and in the English classes. Um, I remember last year when I was taking um, AP environmental science, um, we had one small part about environmental racism and that was just shoved in at the end of our um, studies. And even though that was at the end, we still didn't really learn about stuff that was happening currently in America, such as like the toxic air pollution in Chicago or lead poisoning in Los Angeles. Um, it's important to teach students about what is happening in communities really next door to us. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's important to put more Black authors and Black voices in our English curriculum. Um, while everyone's uh, trying to um, get involved in anti-racism reading outside of school, it's important to also have that in our school curriculum. And then um, following Amanda Gordon's um, amazing poetry at the inauguration, I saw this quote that says, there's an Am Amanda Gorman at every high school that you may call underperforming or not worth the funding. So I think that, um, also, while we're talking about being inclusive of all students, we need to put an urgency on honoring students' arts and students' voices, especially the voices of students of color who may be the next inaugural poet. Um, we shouldn't uh, shut down their dreams of doing something that may not seem uh, conventional in the eyes of our current school curriculum. So I think that those are all really important to focus on. Ms. Murphy, I'll go to you next. I think words absolutely matter. And I think that each of our students deserve, just like Mr. Hurtado said, to see themselves in not only as teachers, but in literature, like Reagan said, they deserve to see themselves represented. We could all agree that it, um, our American history is very whitewashed and that's exactly what we need to get away from. And, and, and by introducing these no, new social studies standards and by watching our words, as Reagan said, and by being intentional with what we say and how it's written, that is how we move forward together. So the words matter. All the words that are being debated, they matter. As a seventh and eighth grade social studies teacher when I was in middle school, our middle school textbook, which was from you know, probably right when Reagan was born, it was written then, you know, um, it had one paragraph, which was about half a page talking about the Holocaust. That was the entirety of information on the Holocaust in my seventh and eighth grade textbook. And one of my students, she was just, I mean, she wanted to write him a letter. She wanted to like immediately like start an, a campaign that, you know, you can't learn everything that you need to know about that time in history and that specific event in one paragraph. So when we take important things like that and we either diminish them, make them smaller, less important seeming, 
we're doing such a disservice to our students and we have to do better. I agree completely, language matters. And what I'm hearing, unfortunately, um, are a lot of individuals who are having debates about concepts on which I believe they're ill-informed. Uh, we need to make sure that we're investing more time truly understanding what these concepts mean before we start having these debates. Secondly, I would argue that it's critically important that we operationalize terms. I think we're having people talk beyond one another, past one another, because they're using terms and those terms have not been uh, defined in a consistent way so that we can discuss the concepts from the same point of reference. So it's critically important that we educate ourselves so that we can become more informed about what we mean relative to anti-racism, anti-bias, so on and so forth. The other thing that I would uh, want to point out in terms of the importance of culturally relevant pedagogy in our classrooms, it's critically important that all of our teachers, that's not our teachers of color, we tend to relegate this only to our teachers of color, but this is important for all of our teachers because it engages all of our students. Research shows us consistently that teachers who use culturally relevant pedagogy have higher rates of student engagement among all their students. Why? Representation matters. If I see myself, hear myself, learn about myself and the value that we bring to a context, then I'm gonna be more engaged in the conversation. It's reflective of who I am and the experiences that I bring to bear. Gloria Lassen Billings defines culturally relevant pedagogy using three tenets. Academic excellence, meaning that we intentionally focus on the attainment of discipline specific content knowledge at a very high level so that you get to know the content information at an optimal level. Secondly, cultural competence, meaning a classroom teacher has taken the time to truly know who his or her students are, meaning that you spend time with students beyond the classroom and beyond the school, learning more about their cultural backgrounds, making strategic connections between your content and who your students are and what their aspirations are. And the most important tenet that we often overlook, critical consciousness, having the ability to take what you've learned in this content specific course and now apply it to your community or to your society so that you can uplift what occurs in that society. So the educational experience becomes about us, not about me. Students of color are part of a collectivist identity. It's about us. So the more that I can connect what I'm learning to how I can improve us, then the more likely I will likely recall what I've learned in your classroom. We first must acknowledge our history we have to accept the truths of our history, and then we have to move forward in that history. When we talk about representation in our classrooms, we often tie it to workforce sort of outcomes, which are incredibly important, don't get me wrong, right? College access, you know, are we placing them in jobs, et cetera? But this, the, one of the original purposes of our public education system was also as a cornerstone of our democracy. And, and at the moment, right, if you haven't noticed our democracy is currently hanging on by a thread. And I think for, for us to really heal some of the breaches in our communities, we have to think about what does history and social studies mean for a community that is as diverse as it's ever been and that will continue to, to be uh, more diverse. And so I think that we need to have honest conversations and lean into that discomfort about what it means to collectively embrace this history that we have as a nation and, and really move forward because I think learning about the, the tough battles fought and won in the past uh, and how we've come to where we are today makes us stronger. And, and I think that is the beauty of America. And I think that is the beauty of having these conversations. We've had tough conversations with the students that we work with every day, and it's made them even more proud to be a part of this nation, to be to lean into this experiment that we call democracy. And so I hope we continue having these conversations because I think it's absolutely imperative that we do so. I want to give you each about 30 seconds um, to just give a closing statement about you know, anything you'd like to talk about about what you hope to see for this year or um, for the future in general. From policymakers and edu the education community, I hope to see a change in the way that students' mental health is valued in the schools, as well as um, what we talked about earlier with the change in the curriculum. I think that now is a better time than ever to make these changes, especially seeing as Black History Month is, begins in a few days. Um, I know that me and other students are tired of watching the same movies in class um, that teachers pull out to talk about Black history. Um, and while 
rather than water down our blackness, I hope that we move towards um, celebrating black joy and creativity more in our school systems. We are creating change. And if we can keep doing that, if we can keep moving forward, and if we can keep um, chipping away, I don't even think that that's an accurate term because we should be like running towards Leandro case. We should be running full speed ahead, doing every single thing we can to make this not like a five-year plan, but like a right now plan, like today. What are we going to do today to start working on this? So I hope that each of you will, will be that change, will be the light for the whole education community. Specifically to our policymakers, I have two simple concrete ask of you. Ask number one, please read the Drive Task Force report and our recommendations, create sensible legislation around those recommendations and fully fund those recommendations to ensure that our students across the state of North Carolina have access to highly qualified teachers of color in our low income schools, our rural schools and our urban schools. So that's number one. Number two, revisit our policies, our funding appropriations and our accountability models that perpetuate school resegregation and creates a system that blames the disenfranchised for the disenfranchisement. If we do those two things, then we take a significant leap forward in the state of North Carolina. I'd say my uh, overarching message is, is really to lead with urgency this year, right? There is relief that we need to work on immediately when it comes to federal dollars that will be coming to North Carolina soon. And we think about challenges we're facing immediately. But I also think about what it looks like to temper that urgency with patience. Uh, we have been through a lot. Uh, we continue to go through a lot. Uh, I heard a lot of talk on the previous conversation around the state of our mental health, what anxiety and isolation is doing to our kids, to our families, to us. Uh, and, and so I really wanna think about what re-entry into life looks like. Uh, we historically have not done re-entry well in any issue, uh, but really thinking about what it means to recover from this and, and come out stronger on the other side together. Um, lastly, for me, I see hope on the horizon. I see students like Reagan, I see the students I work with every day and know that as long as we continue to center students, families and our community, that, that, that we can make progress on many of these issues. And so I'm excited to continue working with, with our younger generations to make sure that we are keeping our eye on the prize. I'm feeling incredibly inspired by all of you. We're so lucky to have you as leaders in our state. So thank you so much for joining us today. After the break, this week's final word. Before, during, and after COVID, equity has been and will be at the core of our work. Today, we featured the panelists from our Eggs and Issues event focused on the role that equity must play in education policy decision-making. Representative Ricky Hurtado reminded us that lawmakers will grapple with meeting our constitutional obligation to ensure every student has access to a sound basic education and that our state leaders must act through innovation and strong investments in our public schools. Ms. Reagan Rezon, a student leader who is a member of the Wake County Black Student Coalition, explained her work toward ending the systemic racism in our schools, impressing upon us that as we all work together towards its end, stronger bonds will form between our students, teachers, and communities. Ms. Maggie Murphy, a teacher in Allegheny County Schools, emphasized that students of color deserve to see more teachers of color in their classrooms, but almost also must see themselves represented in the literature and the history that we teach. Dr. Anthony Graham shared that our schools have been resegregating both racially and economically. Since 1996, the number of segregated schools in this country has doubled. And too often the schools that the students in our communities of colors attend are also under-resourced. There must be places where we teach students how to share power and resources to create a society that is just and equitable. Our guests today remind me that we have so much work to do together, but if we acknowledge our deficiencies, recognize our strengths, and identify paths forward that support the success of all, lifting up those who need greater support with more targeted resources and visionary leadership, we can accomplish so much. Thank you so much for joining us to learn and think about education. We'll see you next week.